so many times. Clearly an accomplished fellow, many years, 40 some years now of experience in architecture and, and urban planning, has worked on projects throughout the world. His people gladly have put a, a few examples around the room. Very impressive uh, uh, buildings, of course, throughout, um, throughout the world and continues to do this. And um, oh, many other accolades, so many I, I, I just couldn't even begin to, uh, to talk about. But I know he's, he's, he lectures throughout the, the world, Harvard, MIT, many other countries across Asia, Europe, North America, and so forth. So some of the, his, his material he's kind of collected here that is suitable for our, our situation in, in Philippines. So, so we hope it's, it's worthwhile. We are videotaping it, so hopefully we can put it online afterwards. Because um, a lot of the material will go quite fast. As you know, it does go quite fast. And it's good to have it. Uh, I often will watch his, his videotapes afterwards. But some of the things, um, oh, planning. Um, Halifax Associate had planned more than 16 billion square meters of land and design and architecture more than 12 million square meters of building floor in 38 countries. Um, many hundreds of, of awards. First Filipino architectural firm included in the top 500 architecture firms in the world, um, and so on. I don't know. Do you know I'll bore you with all these all, all these accolades and so forth. So please welcome the interesting and intelligent uh, June Palafox of the state. Thanks again. I see. Familiar faces have been here before in this, this, this lectures, and uh, when I saw the, the ad of, of announcing this, I complained to both Richard and Rebecca, but we agreed to disagree. They called me activist architect. And then when I turned off people coming over, and that's why I've been an architect, environmental planner, urban planner. I do architectural activism when I see corruption, or when trees are being held down, and so on. Because I'm also an ex-seminarian, former seminarian, in the seminary, it told us that if you do something wrong like corruption, you don't report it, you're part of the corruption. So I think that, that's, a, that's a. Asian city is ascending. What qualifies me here is uh, maybe it's uh, I'm a fellow of the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. It's headquartered in Chicago. In 2013, I was one of two elevated as fellows from all over the world, just two of us. And the other ones that lived there are Burj Khalifa the tallest building in the world today. So it, it was a pleasant surprise for me. And I've been representing this country maybe for 10 years. We're the ones, uh, City BUH, uh, certifying the tallest buildings in the world. And uh, and before we start with the slides, um, um, I just I just had a few notes that I I prepared uh, at 4 o'clock this morning. <laughs> Because the, the, the title is Architect Tall Buildings, uh, Super Tall Mega Tall Buildings Towards Vertical Urbanism. And many of us should probably be surprised that uh, 2014, the tall buildings moved from North America to Asia. And the tallest building in the world is uh, Burj Khalifa, 828 meters. Or the Paramount Sources we've designed a 1,200 meter building in Abu Dhabi but it's put on hold after the, the, the Arab Spring. And three of them are in Dubai, and, and one in Mecca, the tallest building, then Taipei, 101, Shanghai, two, Hong Kong, three, Kuala Lumpur, the Twin Towers. Uh, sometimes they, they count them as two, Twin Towers. Nanjing, China, one, uh, Chicago, USA, Shenzhen, China, Two, Guangzhou in China, uh, two, Kuwait, one, Abu Dhabi. So, number one in the world now, in the tallest buildings in the world, are in China. Ten tallest buildings out of the 20. And United Arab Emirates, four out of the 20. And USA, only two. So, it has shifted from North America to Asia. And if we count Dubai, Saudi Arabia is Asia, because Asia is up to the Bosporus, uh, or the, the middle of, of Istanbul, and up to Russia, Asia, and Europe. So 
10 tall buildings in China, tallest buildings in China, four in UAE, and two in the USA. And keywords, I hope, I just realized we have 275 slides, because I have 80 pages of notes. Then I probably do eight seconds per slide. Right? And some keywords that I hope we'll be able to tackle them. Um, tall buildings, mega tall buildings, super tall buildings. Tall building is 150 meters high till about below 300 meters. Uh, super tall buildings is 300 and above, below 600. And uh, super tall buildings, 600 meters and above. And at the moment, a one kilometer building and higher being built in, in Saudi Arabia. The tallest right now is 828 in Dubai. So some key words that uh, you may want to remind me of, we don't discuss it. Tall buildings, mega tall buildings, super tall buildings, vertical urbanism or vertical cities, or, of course, architecture, urban planning, urban habitat, because most of this load is from the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. I've given this talk four times in Russia last September, also in Shanghai, uh, that just last year. And in Mumbai, I was invited to talk on the Rome, remaking of Mumbai. And we identified 32,000 buildings in Mumbai vulnerable to disasters. I think, if, if I may, India is their democracies as chaotic as ours, if not more chaotic, but they seem to have stronger political will to implement it. So the proposal we have is demolish those 32,000 buildings, transfer them in transition homes, and rebuild those areas with more open spaces but vertical cities, like Singapore and Hong Kong. Another key words, ecological, environmental, social, aesthetic, design principles, vernacular. Then another, uh, cluster of words, tropical community, sustainability, livability, high density, and 3D urban planning. That's what we do at Palavox Solicitor and Palavox Architecture. We don't do two-dimensional planning. We do uh, three-dimensional. Urban density, porous high-rise, uh, permeable design, public space, spatial continuity, sectional variety, organic grids, urban fabric, other keywords, height, heritage, we had a conference in London two years ago, Height and Heritage. Even traditional cities like London, Paris, Frankfurt, Berlin, they started embracing tall buildings. So there's a good combination between tall buildings and, and heritage buildings. Like, they would not have our problems like after you top off the building, somebody says, you, bu you violated the monument of Jose Rizal. But before, elsewhere in the world, before you build, like the city planner of London, I had a long conversation with him. They put a red mark. You can go as high as you can, as long as you can justify, provided you don't block the visual corridor to Big Ben, uh, the parliament, and uh, the copula of St. Paul's Cathedral. But you are told before you, you, you groundbreak, not here after you top of the building, they tell you, you should have done that. So, <laughs> high, the heritage, technology, competition, sustainability, again, humanity and spirit. Then space formation, social interaction, civic nucleus, uh, urban fabric, communities and space generator. And we talk about towards 2050. Most of our planning horizon is 2050. And, uh, and uh, thanks, Ambassador. You come to listen. Ambassador from Iran with us here. He's inviting us to work in Iran. I've done, we've done work in Iran. Uh, in Bam Iran after a big earthquake. I think we are excellent to bring here. We have two Iranians here. Other one is an architect in our office. Some there, yeah. So, uh, so we are, yeah. So towards 2050 as a planning horizon, towards 2021. Why 2021? The Philippines will be 500 years old on March 16, 2021. And then 2030, another, year, another planning horizon in 2025. HSBC, Goldman Sachs had uh, forecasted that the Philippines can, will be in the top 19 economies of the world by 2025. Top 19. Provided we address our challenges of corruption towards good governance, criminality towards better prison order, climate change towards uh, protection and enhancement of the environment. 
Then, of course, future high-rise modular. Another one uh, group of keywords that I try to present visually. Sky bridges and skywalks, pedestrian walkways, retail branding, rethinking our cities. One of my professors in Harvard graduate school of design used to tell us that this century will be a rare century. Reimagine, replan, reengineer, uh, rethink, uh, uh, recycle, reuse, uh, hopefully redevelopment, renewal. Hopefully we'll have urban renaissance. Pedestrian circulation is very important. Urban fabric. Integrated design, energy consumption, public space, sustainable concepts, architecture, combining architecture and engineering, or architect planning, architecture and urban planning, architect design, or architecture, interior design, and so on, environmental planning, and the recent as I mentioned, public rooms, urban spaces in the sky, sky parks, sky gardens, vertical gardens, and I show it to you later. Why? Is high rise more sustainable? Uh, we've designed several high rise buildings, and if I may, closest to here is uh, Rockwell Center. We master planned the 50 and a half hectares, and we're the architects for the first five towers. Rizal Luna, Amor Soli East, Amor Soli West, and Hidalgo. And that west block of Rockwell, the density is 200 families per hectare. And the same first class in Mecca and fourth class. The same income class as those living in Forest Park. Forest Park is four families per hectare versus 200 families per hectare. So you can conclude which is more sustainable, having 200 families in one hectare or only four families per hectare. And many of the towers being done now, whether the Burj Dubai, Burj Khalifa, or the Shanghai Tower, designed by one of my professors in the Harvard graduates to design art Gensler, they put together, like the top floors, cultural facilities and observation deck. So you have tourism on the top floors. Then uh, zone, zone 9. Every zone something like 10 to 12 floors. And in between you have sky gardens or refugee floors in case there are, in case there are disasters. So zone number 8, the next level going down, hotels and boutique offices. Then zone seven, more hotel rooms. Zone six, offices, zone five, offices. Zone three, offices. Zone two, offices. Then retail, shopping, and dining, zone one. Sky gardens in between 12 floors. And um, zone nine is five levels. That's the Shanghai Tower by Ernst Gensler. And why is that more sustainable? It's putting together nine blocks of the city in one building. So even utilities, it goes to one point only. Even collecting garbage, instead of dump trucks, traveling maybe, what, uh, 20 kilometers to collect garbage, it's only one going to one point. So high-rise buildings are more sustainable even in the use of, of very, very, very uh, uh, rare, diminishing urban land resources. And, um, and some design principles that uh, we'd like as a take out lesson from here, from to this afternoon. And again, from Council for Tall Buildings and um, um, Urban Habitat, uh, presented by Anthony Wood in Shanghai last time. Tall buildings should relate to the physical characteristic of the place. Some buildings, there's uniqueness of the place. And I think one thing that comes to mind is uh, the Taipei 101. It's like a pagoda. So there's a sense of place. Or the, the, the Petronas Towers. There's a sense of place. If you look at the floor plan, it's the Islamic form of a star. So there's something about it. And uh, tall buildings should also relate to the environmental characteristics of the place. And then cultural characteristics of the place, variation in, with height and form, texture and development program, maximizing layers of program, and the uh, floor use and all systems. Number six, tall buildings should provide significant communal open recreational spaces so we can have sky gardens and refugee floors, introducing more facade envelope opacity. 
Many of the tower buildings now are all mirrors and glass. They actually reflect the sun, create the island heat effect. And there are very examples of buildings where it's not all glass. It's, there is some opaqueness also. And we, we do also green architecture. And in our part of the world, at least 50% of the building should be operable to let the, the light and ventilation come in. 50% solid wall. But it's so easy to do all class. And because of the technology also, but the effect on the environment, it may increase the whole thing, uh, uh, the whole, the heat effect, island heat effect, we call it. So embrace organic vegetation as an essential part of the material palette. So we, we, many of the projects we're doing now, we have vertical gardens. You get, sometimes we specify organic plants, vegetable plants, to climb on the walls and on the roof garden. They can also be used as insulation, not just for aesthetics, but also for uh, food security. And um, introducing physical, circulatory, and programmatic connections between tall buildings, scar bridges. I have another provocative proposal, I'm told, to make EDSA corridor elevated walkway, which I found out when it's uh, Friday payday and it's raining, faster to walk from Ayala to Kugao. <laughs> so why not just make an elevated walkway and uh, all throughout the 27 kilometers of EDSA, that and another one that we have proposed, it's being funded now, but Pasig River is also about 27 kilometers. So river walk connecting Manila Bay Walk and and Laguna Lake. And we also have proposed Laguna Lake, 250 kilometers of lakefront walk. So we make our cities more walkable. And we need to bring all aspects of the city up to the sky. So I mentioned a while ago, 2014, uh, Asia will have 18 out of the uh, 20 tallest buildings in the world. And America, only two. And we fast forward to tallest 20 buildings in 2020, one kilometer, 1,000 meters and above. The current tallest now is Burj Khalifa, 828 meters. Under construction, Kingdom Tower in Jeddah is, will be 1,000 kilometers, uh, 1,000 meters, one kilometer. They have not announced the final height. Usually it's kept a secret. Yeah, and Jeddah, one, no, Dubai, still the second, with two, two buildings. Hochu, China, one, Shenzhen, China, one, Jakarta, India, uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. They will have they will have the fifth tallest building in the world by by 2020. Uh, Wuhan, China, 27, another building. Shanghai, another uh, Ch uh, Shanghai, China. They have two. Mecca, Saudi Arabia, another one. Tianjin, China, one. Shenzhen, China. Shenyang, China, another one. Seoul, Korea, they'll make it to the top 20. One. The next is uh, uh, USA, one. Guangzhou, China, one. Changjin, China, another one. Beijing, China, another one. Dalian, China, another one. Taipei, one. And Hong Kong, one. So the tallest, uh, other tallest buildings, uh, Dubai has, it, by 2020, Dubai will have two, and Shanghai will have another two. So China will have 11 out of the tallest 20 buildings in the world by 2020. Um, UAE will have two of the top 20 buildings in the world, uh, both in Dubai, and USA only one. Asia will have 19, America will only have one. So that's why the, the topic today is Asian cities ascending. And uh, there are 200,000 people a day move to the cities every day. And year 2000 there, there was a study when, uh, that was done when uh, I was doing some uh, work in Harvard, graduate school design. Metro Manila, then year 2000 was the fastest growing metropolis in the world. 60 persons per hour, per hour, that's year 2000. Delhi, if I remember it right, was 47 persons per hour. London, Paris, New York, about five to seven persons per hour. Uh, Moscow was negative two per hour. They were discouraging too much, due mainly to in, in migration. So it's really true that uh, it's really a problem and a challenge that 
Metro Manila is being labeled as the Imperial Manila to the rest of the country. So we really have to address that and the primacy of Metro Manila is unhealthy. So we cannot address all our problems in Metro Manila with looking at Metro Manila alone. And that this might be a controversial observation, but in 1998 we had the conference of American Planning Association in Boston. And the title of the conference was Revolutionary Ideas in Urban Planning, Architecture, and Real Estate. And many of the speakers are saying, when you have a single family house, a villa, in the middle of the cities, which I think many of us live right now, in gated communities in the middle of the city, you have a higher carbon footprint because you are arrogating to yourself prime urban land resources preventing more families to live closer to their places of work. You're encouraging more urban sprawl to encroach into the forest, into the farms. And, uh, and just a bit of historical development of our cities. Under the Spaniards for uh, all the Spanish colonies, uh, last is last Filipinas and uh, Latin America, all the colonies of Spain, we had the same pattern of uh, town planning, uh, laws of the Indies, promulgated by King Philip of Spain for the Philippine was named after. All our towns and cities should have the church and the town plaza, which was very good. At least every Sunday, regardless of income class, we come together to the town plaza. But you don't even, but only the Illustrados and the Principalia live within the Intramuros, inside the walls. And the peasants, the Sanglais, the Chinese merchants, and the Indios, extramuros, outside the walls. If you look at the pattern of urban development in our country, we still have the rich and powerful intramuros inside the walls, close to the central plaza, the central business district. And the Indios, the peasants, spend 1,000 hours a year in traffic. So it's a no-brainer. But if you go to Spain, they don't have that pattern. The Plaza Mayor is surrounded by higher density housing, mixed-use development, so that more people can enjoy the amenity value of the Central Plaza. And in Latin America, because they have revolutionary mayors like Curitiba, James Lerner, and uh, Bogota, they changed the whole thing. And when Daniel Burnham came to the Philippines, the American architect, town planner, 1905. He planned Manila way ahead of Chicago. Chicago in Baguio was 1909. And his inspiration for the planning of Manila was not an American city. It was Paris and Venice. Paris, River Seine, Pasig River. The wide boulevards of Paris, three line. Uh, and then, and then the uh, river promenades and so on. And Venice, the canals of Venice, the Steros of Manila. And Manila Bay, the Bay of Naples in Italy. So where the Americans were here, we're following a European city-inspired urban planning for our cities, both Manila and Baguio. But after the America, and the Americans were there, the American foreign engineers, they planned Manila like a half of a wheel, where you have the port of Manila with regional roads like spokes of the wheel, and ring roads. We're supposed to have six ring roads. ETSA is ring road number four, circumference road number four, uh, 54 meters wide, built in 1954. So for a time, it was called Highway 54. And, and, but when we became a strong republic, we threw away the advantages of the loss of the Indies, that we central class and so on. We threw away the the design planning principles of Daniel Bernhardt. You know what we did? We copied Hollywood. Hollywood and Los Angeles were designed for the automobile, not for the pedestrian. And American planning, post-war planning, they also the influence of Detroit, Michigan, the automakers. They even bought the railways of the US so they could be converted into freeways and busways. Now, American planners now are looking back, it should not have been allowed to, to, 
to do away with the railway. Now they, they're bringing back. So I've met three mayors of Los Angeles, the current one and two previous ones, in big conferences in Los Angeles. And they announced to the rest of the world that the Los Angeles planning is a 60-year-old mistake. And they are correcting it now, making it more walkable and so on. So I have con conversations with them afterwards and tell them, congratulations, you're admitting your mistake and letting the rest of the world this was a mistake. And they're sending away their architects' banners to unlearn their mistakes. Singapore, Curitiba, London, Paris, New York, Tokyo, Hong Kong. And I share with them that we have good for them, but I have a bigger problem in my country. Where are you from? The Philippines. What's your problem? We copied all your mistakes, and they found their way into our planning, zoning, restrictions, building code, and leaders of industry and government are not even aware of it. So that's where we are. So I should go now with these slides. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe you, you override me, Lam. Yeah, maybe override me eight seconds per slide so I don't, I don't talk too long. Yeah. All right, green is smart. So we, we go to New York and Chicago where the skyscraper cities. So New York, next one. Um, uh, adaptation resilience for New York. And they keep adapting. Uh, that's still New York. Uh, the Hudson Yards, it's a new construction in, in New York right now. And it was an uh, industrial yard. Um, uh, this is it. Again, uh, the architect is one of my professors in Harvard Graduate School, Eugene Cohn. This is uh, the one below, is the High Line in New York. London Elevated uh, Railway. They converted it into through private sector initiative. And they, the maintenance cost is $8 million a year. Donations, $30 million a year. And they're using this interconnecting with buildings. Next slide. Um, Central Park, New York. Of course, it was a big decision to carve out a big park in the middle of the city. Parks are amenity values. Usually when you park or waterfront, you put a high-rise building. So I can't blame the high-rises near Luneta because Luneta is an amenity value. So you have more people within walkable distance to an amenity value. Next slide. Uh, Chicago. Actually, the tall building started in Chicago. They used to have the tallest buildings in the world. Next slide. And you can see, can, can you backtrack Chicago? The same plan of Daniel Burnham for Manila. The Lakeshore Boulevard. Dewey Boulevard. Next slide. It's in Chicago. Next one. San Francisco. And Bay Phoenix City. Next. Uh, San Francisco again. Seattle. One of the greenest cities in the world with high rises. Next slide. Uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I, I like this place not because I spend a lot of time there, but they have what they call the Boston Net Place. All the parks in Boston are interconnected with pedestrian pathways and so on. Uh, Rose Harf in Boston. So, and you can see uh, lots of greeneries interconnected to walkways. You can walk all over metropolitan Boston walking. And Boston is a healthier city than Los Angeles. We did a case study comparing Boston, metropolitan area, and, and uh, Los Angeles. There are more obesities and heart attacks in Los Angeles because you always take the car. And in Boston, you're penalized to use the car. And you have to walk, and mass run is very, uh, uh, it's very convenient. And healthy cities, when each street, the, the people and residents, healthy cities, walk 10,000 steps a day to be healthy, 10,000 steps a day. Unfortunately, in our part of the world, the Department of Transportation doesn't recognize walking as a number one choice of transportation. So they, they will fix our sidewalks, our sidewalks is for parking, not for pedestrians. And, and walk out, there are 20 modes of transportation, walking is number one. So that's the Boston necklace, next slide. Uh, Vancouver, one of the most visually, visually powerful cities in the world and one of the greenest also. Next slide. Best green building policies in Canada. Next slide. Uh, Vancouver, Canada. Canada's greenest city. Toronto, their vertical city also. 
although they have the suburbs or uh, low density neighborhoods. Next slide. Uh, Portland, Oregon, one of the most the most sustainable city in North America. And you can see the can you back that? Back. You can see the roadway designated for pedestrians, bicycles, and, and so on. Next slide. Uh, Portland, Oregon. Next slide. Uh, Curitiba, Brazil. There was a time, I think 30 years ago, the mayor was an architect urban planner and most of the councilors were architects urban planners. So Curitiba is one of the greenest cities in the world right now. And uh, Jim Lerner was one of my fellow uh, guest lecturers in Harvard Graduate School of Design. And same with Bogota. Bogota mayor, he, he really improved in Bogota. Now he is uh, working in New York in the transportation department. Next slide. Still in Curitiba, one of the greenest cities in the world, most sustainable urban traffic management. Next slide. Uh, Bogota, Colombia. The former mayor, I forgot his name, he said that when rich people in the city, in the country, walk, walk to work as a transportation and public transit, you're a first world city. When, when leaders of industry and government, uh, that's more walking and public transit. Next slide. Uh, London. I told you about London had always been anti-tall buildings. Now they have embraced the city, and you can see this. Uh, can you take stay here? These two buildings here, the egg shape, forgot the name, and then the, the shard. The shard is pyramidal building. Um, they were asked to go taller. The first proposal of it was square this. But there was a, it was blocking the visual corridor to the Big Ben, I think, and the copula of the cathedral. So they're trying to go taller, but make it more pyramid. And one thing in London and most European cities, uh, some countries, developers, they, they know how to reach the sky, but they don't know how to meet the ground. So these buildings in London, the first two floors, so at least the first floor and the top floor, is for public access. It's all right to, to pay. So that the, 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 the street level continues to the ground floor. They have museums, restaurants, and so on. The same with the observation deck. So it's inclusive for everyone to enjoy it. Next slide, they enjoy the city. So you can see in here, this is when we had the uh, uh, Height and Heritage Conference in London two years ago. So they're blending together. Next slide. Uh, then the Bed Set Development in the United Kingdom. It's, it's a green development, sustainable. Solar, rainwater harvesting, and so on. Next slide, solar power. Stockholm, Sweden. <coughs> Europe's green capital of 2010. Next slide. Uh, the hammer is so against the uh, people who see them here, Stockholm, hammer with short stand. Next slide. So these are reducing the carbon footprint of the city and the rest. And Hamburg, Germany, one of the leaders also. Um, Europe's green capital city 2011, Hamburg. You can see Berlin, Germany. They now imported the tricycles. Yeah. I took this picture myself. Next slide. And Blending modern and classic architecture. Maybe this, this last dome here. They, our, some of our very conservative regulatory regime, they may not allow you to do something like this. In Berlin, the old buildings, they want you to make a residential <coughs> tent house. So that in the center of the city, there's always population even at night. So they encourage residential development even on top of old buildings. Next slide. Uh, Switzerland, one of the greenest cities in the world and sustainable. Next slide. And Zurich, they make the waterways as really as a, a, a part of transportation. Next slide. And Paris and France, when this Eiffel Tower was built, it was so controversial. They were accused of uglifying the city. Now it's a landmark. Next slide. Uh, yeah, Paris and France. Most of European cities are eight-story affair. Like Barcelona, Paris, London, eight stories. You wouldn't see a single family home in the middle of the city. They would consider it it's a car high carbon footprint. When you have a big wheel in the middle of the city, you go to the suburbs. Don't stay in the city. Next slide. Uh, river Sand. Passing river would have been like this. If we follow Daniel Burnham's proposals. Next slide. Uh, Vienna. Pedestrian streets, next slide. Walking as a mode of transport. Urban sustainability, again in Sweden, 
And we have this in, in the north, in Ilocos. Uh, they start with wind energy. Next slide. Um, urban sustainability again in Sweden. Next slide. Uh, Copenhagen. You can see the relationship between the city and the waterfront. Next slide. And carbon management and planning, Copenhagen. Walking is really the preferred mode of urban transport. Next slide. Uh, Amsterdam, Netherlands, intelligent city structure. You see the canals? Our stairs would have been like this. Next slide. Um, say in Amsterdam, climate street, smart, um, smart turtle. So it's really a planning policy to make smarter cities, more sustainable cities. Next slide. And uh, geothermal driven city, Reykjavik, Iceland. Next. Uh, hydrogen powered public transportation in Iceland. Uh, Venice, Italy. Our steros could have been like this. Uh, the Melbourne Homes Dream. Next slide. Uh, Helsinki, Finland. Next. Elsewhere in the world, waterfront is a front door of development. In our country, it's a garbage bin, basurahan, back of the house. And in the Middle East, we even create artificial uh, lakes and lagoons to get the amenity value of the waterfront. In the Philippines, we have the third longest coastline in the world, but we make we don't know how to use it. And most development, again, uh, experience having done work in 38 countries, waterfront real estate is 50% higher than inland. Gulf fairway lots is only 35% higher. The waterfront is higher in value acquisition. But Spain, San Sebastian, a lot of good planning space, especially Barcelona. Next slide. Uh, Moscow, Russia. I was speaker in Russia, as I thought, four times. Similar tactic, vertical cities. And next slide. Uh, building, by building vertical cities, we can save energy, support our growing population, and preserve our horizontal spaces for food production and nature. Next slide. Uh, Dubai. It's something close to my heart because when I was 36 years old, I was invited by the ruler of Dubai out of 20 invited architects, planners, urban planners from 14 countries. I was the youngest, only Southeast Asian. And the Dubai had very, very clear, clear goals. Dubai is so open, like, like the ambassador of Iran is here, when it's a boycott of Iran, they go through Dubai. <laughs> so you have the Arabian Dows, Persian Dows. <laughs> I don't know if I should share or not, but the rural Dubai only had five instructions to us. One was to bring Dubai from the fourth world into the first world in 15 years. I think they were able to do it in 10 years. So they can create a garden city out of the desert. So we were importing garden soil from Pakistan, irrigation from Germany, flowers from Holland. Then design Dubai as if there's no oil. Because in 35 years, they would have run out of oil. So in 1977 to 81, we were planning the golf courses in the desert, the largest dry dock for a ship that was like that built, uh, the tallest building in the Middle East, which was in the Trade Center, just 32 stories, and so on and so forth. And the airport, airport driven city, Aerotropolis, the Jebel Ali, the largest man-made harbor in the world. All of the, those were done when we were there. And he borrowed money to Lloyds of London to leverage it against future income in oil. Because they do not have enough, as much resources as Saudi Arabia, Iran, Abu Dhabi, and so on. They fast track their infrastructure, borrowing money, leverage it against future income in oil. So that, that time, I think Dubai was 98% oil income, 2% non-oil. Today, Dubai is the reverse. I think 95% tourism, shopping, dining, trade and commerce, and maybe just uh, five percent in oil, mostly refinery. They get it from others. So, what did I see in Dubai? Working with Sheikh Rashid bin Said Al Maktoum, the father of Sheikh Mohammed. So, with progressive cities and countries of the world, only five qualities: strong, visionary leadership, leadership with vision. Number one. Number two, strong political will to implement the vision. Number two, good planning. So we need urban planners. In our country, we're second class. Uh, uh, good design, so we need the architects and engineers. Then good governance, in that order. You cannot pretend to go good governance if you don't have political will, 
vision, you don't have good planning, you don't have good design. So there's no way for you. It was a desert for the Bedouins before. Next slide. Um, and this was no way, 1960. And another one that I like very much was for every year of service, my family would opportunity to go around the world. And the real Dubai's instruction was go out and copy. You copy the best in the world. And that was my first exposure to benchmarking. So my colleagues and other colleagues, they went to the US on London, Paris, New York. But I thought London, Paris, New York took many centuries to become first world cities. So I investigated what cities in the world became first world in less than 15 years. San Francisco, go west young man. So San Francisco started with gold. From gold to construction boom camp, banking center, education center, uh, aerospace center, now information technology center. So they were able to evolve from one resource to the other. Many of the gold towns in the US already, like ghost towns today, if they were not able to evolve from one resource to another. Then Hong Kong. How did Hong Kong get started? Opium. I'm not saying we started with opium. Let's start with opium. Then it became a trading center. Uh, then the, the, the migrant contingents from Shanghai, they brought with them to Hong Kong then manufacturing steel and garment making steel. So from opium to trading to manufacturing, garment making, to a commercial center, tourism center, and so on. Uh, Singapore just copied Hong Kong with more landscaping. And uh, Lake Wainu decreed that for every plant your tree and grow for five years, visible from a major total fear, was tax deductible for five years. So after five years, the tree can take care of itself. Compared to our country, after the photo opportunity, everybody, everybody forgets about the tree. Next slide. So this was Dubai 1960. This is Dubai today. Even this is a man-made creek, this one, in the desert. Next slide. Um, yeah, this used to be the, the first seven-star hotel in the world. When it just opened, it was fully booked. The, um, the suite were $56,000 a night. It was fully booked. The smaller rooms were $3,000 a night. Just like throwing one pajero every night. But it was fully booked. Next, next slide. So, Dubai Creek. Oh, for all of these are man-made imported garden soil and so on. Dubai Creek. One of the first things that the, the rural Dubai dreads make it navigable. Next slide. So uh, the ports and so on. The port driven city. The landscape. There's more landscape than Makati. Next slide. Uh, Dubai Palm Islands. Dubai only had 70 kilometers of waterfront. And everything sold out as expensive real estate. So Sheikh Mohammed decided to do the Palm Islands to artificially add 2,000 kilometers more of urban waterfront. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, Wireless Smart City Dubai. This is the Burj Khalifa. Originally, it was named Burj Dubai, but they did not have enough money to complete it, so I borrowed from, from the, uh, the ruler of Abu Dhabi, uh, Sheikh Khalifa. That's what they Sheikh Khalifa. So look at this picture again. The top floor is tourism observation, then the hotels, then the condominiums, offices, shopping, dining. So just like putting together 10 blocks of the city, in one vertical structure. So which is more sustainable, it's probably 10 blocks or one vertical structure. Next slide. Uh, integ uh, integrated energy strategy 2030 for Dubai. Dubai, I think 2005 had a distinction of the highest carbon footprint per capita in the world. It overtook the USA. So Sheikh Mohammed decided that everything in Dubai now, it must be green, LEED uh, certified. So from 2005, um, because that time, the American style of li uh, lifestyle, we need six planets to, to survive. If the rest of the world, uh, the same lifestyle as the American, six planets. Dubai that time was nine planets, so it was very embarrassing. So uh, Sheikh Mohammed, very smart, he responded, all building construction now, they must be green, sustainable. Next slide. And uh, Shanghai, now they have the, the vertical city increasing, you see, they are getting the most number of tall buildings in, in Asia, probably the world. Until recent times, it was Tokyo, despite their earthquake fault lines. 
they have the most number of tallest buildings in the world. Tall buildings are 150 meters and above. But in Tokyo, they don't build buildings on top of fault lines. I'm not saying we're doing it here. <laughs> Next slide. So these are three towers. The Shanghai Tower, the tallest one, is opening this year. Uh, that's the example that I mentioned to you. Like nine zones, nine city blocks. And the one on the left, the Internal Finance Center, these two tallest buildings, the architects were my professors in Harvard, Art Gensler and Eugene Cohn. Then the, the one on Jim Mao Tower, I worked with him. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, Smart Radical City, Shanghai. Next slide. Uh, Singapore. Next slide. Hong Kong. You know Hong Kong? Uh, is there a next slide for Hong Kong? Next slide. Uh, no, no. Anyway, but Hong Kong, if we use the residential density of Hong Kong, all the world's 7 billion population, we can all fit in the state of Texas. And yet Hong Kong is 70% open space because they are vertical city. Just to ima imagine our urban sprawl in Metro Manila. We cover the land like carpet, also in Baguio. But elsewhere in the world, like in Hong Kong, in their mid-levels, they have tall buildings, so they have a lot of open spaces on the mountainside. Within the city, they have big parks and so on. So there are lungs of the city in a high-density development. Next slide. Uh, Mumbai. Yeah, I told you about the remaking of Mumbai that I spoke about. Uh, 32,000 buildings vulnerable to disasters are being replaced. Next slide. Taipei. Taipei 101. From 2004, I think for about six years, this was the tallest building in the world. I talked to you about sense of place. The inspiration is a pagoda. And one thing they have about this is there's a big wall, pendulum. So that when the building sways, it balances it all. Next slide. Um, Seoul, Korea. They will be in the top 20 tallest buildings in the world. Next slide. Also vertical city. They don't allow single family homes in Korea. It's only in their tourist attractions. They kept some of them for tourist attraction, but it's not allowed to have a single family home in, not in Korea, in Seoul, in Seoul, Korea. Next slide. So Singapore, television city infrastructure. Next slide. Singapore, television city infrastructure again. Uh, still Singapore. So you can see even the blending of height and heritage. Uh, Hong Kong, China, smart energy city. You can see here, the tall buildings beside big, open spaces. That, that's why uh, Hong Kong is uh, considered also a sustainable city. They're being vertical city rather than urban sprawling city. Next slide. Tokyo, it's a collection of neighborhoods. Uh, Finance Economic Development Award. Next slide. Uh, still in Tokyo. Um, and then Tokyo. They are increasing their open spaces. In our part of the world, we are losing some open spaces in the urban areas. Tokyo, Shanghai, most global cities in the world, they are increasing their open spaces. Next slide. Um, Hiroshima, Japan, the most devastated city in the world, uh, World War, World War II. Now this is Hiroshima, Japan. I had the opportunity to meet the. the the mayor, uh, 15 years ago. And he was telling me, I asked him how, what kind of, what type of leadership he had. And he told me, all the telecommunications company, he has them to create something like a concierge. If you want anything from your city, you just get a number and they tell you everything about the city. And again, uh, they were able to build back better, safer, smarter, and more sustainable not just a nice quotable quote. So Hiroshima, they did that. Next slide. And I was hoping we'd have done that in the corridor. I worked on it for the first 30 days. So this is Abu Dhabi, uh, Regional Leadership Award. And there was, a, after the Yuran the Super Typhoon, uh, the president declared that no big soul in the uh, first 40 meters. I, I showed this picture, it can be done. So anything under 40 meters or more, not for habitable spaces, can be for trees, landscaping, or parking buildings. Anyway, cars are insured. Next slide. And 
the first carbon neutral city being built in Abu Dhabi by Norman Foster. Next slide. And what is a tall building? There is, this is from the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. Every year, we debate how to measure the tallest building in the world. And there was a time, uh, Sears Tower, not now Willis Tower in Chicago, and Petronas Tower in Shanghai, they were claiming to be the tallest building in the world. So we went to both of them and, and we declared it was Petronas Tower because the antenna of Petronas Tower was part of the original architecture. And the antenna of Willis Tower, Sears Tower was an addition although it was taller, so we declared. So we, the, the Council for Tall Buildings to do that. The Trump Tower in Hotel in Chicago, we used to measure from the top of the curve, or top of sidewalk, in front of the main entrance, up to the architectural top of the building. Then, a few years ago, we had another challenge and definition again from Donald Trump. Because he built the Trump Tower in Hotel in Chicago, and he has an entrance on the, on the river walk of Chicago River. So it's really lower than the main entrance of the driveway. So he just said we measure from the riverside so he gains more meters in height. And, uh, and for some people, that's very important to them. And we were persuaded only when we saw a lot of uh, ferry boat landing and a lot of pedestrians entering the Trump Tower. So we agreed to change the rules, pedestrian entrance by the river. So you get a few meters, so you make it to the top 20 tallest building. So there is no sort of division of what consists a tall building. It is a building that exhibits an element of tallness in one or more categories. Next slide. So height relative to context, tall building technologies, height relative to context and proportion. This is us, uh, February 2015. Next slide. Uh, building height, tall, 14 or more stories or over 50 meters, 165 feet, considerable. And, but some countries, they, it's 150 meters, but below 300 meters. But in Europe, because they are more of an eight-story uh, uh, cityscape, super tall is 300 meters, 984 feet, up to less than 600 meters. And megatoll is 600 meters. If I remember right, the only two megatoll buildings today is the one in Shanghai, Shanghai Tower, and Burj Khalifa in Dubai, 828 meters. Uh, I'm not sure whether there's more to that. Oh, it's here, no? Taipei 101 is more than 600. Yeah, I think Taipei 101 is there also. Next slide. Height to architectural top. So if it's part of the original architecture, the the tower antenna is measurable. But if it's an addition, we don't include it. The so height is measured from the level of the lowest significant open air pedestrian entrance to the architectural top of the building, including the spires, but not including antennae, if added later, signage, flagpoles, or other functional technical equipment. Next slide. So, uh, like Dubai, how's the high tall building measure? Highest occupied floor is only 584 meters. But the, the top is 828. Next slide. And 829.8, the height to the tip. But uh, I think we recognize only 828. Next slide. So difference between telecommunications tower and a building. So telecommunications tower observation tower in, uh, like in Shanghai, and the Jimang Tower in, in, in Shanghai as well. So the usable floors, the, the blue colors, where you, you have two recent uh, uh, observe, observers on the Shanghai TV Tower, observation deck, and the Jimai Tower, it's, a, it's hotel and offices. Next slide. Uh, simple, single function and mixed use development. So you can have here the the underground floor, the retail shopping, blue is office, then residential, the yellowish parking, observation, the, the, the green, and the gray is the broadcast equipment antenna. One is single function, the other like the John Hancock Center in Chicago, and the Willis Tower is an office, 
the John Humpock Center is a mixed-use development where you can live, work, shop, and dine. Next slide. So structural material, Empire State Building, which is still Alhambra Tower, uh, is concrete. Shanghai World Financial Center is com composite, both steel and concrete. And Princess Tower is a uh, mixed structure. I think this is in Dubai. Next slide. Yeah. Tall building statistics in the world. Uh, 300 meters and above, 87 buildings. 200 meters and above, 933 buildings. 150 meters and above, 3,200 uh, in uh, year 2000. In 2010, shifted now. In Asia, six, if you include the Middle East, plus two, eight in Asia, two in North America. Nothing else in others. So it's really shifting. That's why uh, the title of our talk is Asian cities ascending, going up. Next slide. So, tall buildings in Asia, yeah, I think I mentioned this a while ago. Surprisingly, in, in 2014, the buildings completed, the Philippines ranked number five. You see the construction boom that happened? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's good, but also a concern because our building code is not up to date. You can build a 100-story building here, and you can build another one two meters away. The building code allows you that. So when, when we do tall buildings like we did when we did the five towers of Rockwell, we had to borrow codes from elsewhere. And we call it performance based standard, higher than the local. In Bam Iran, the there was a big earthquake that destroyed factory half of the city and we, we built we designed eleven schools school buildings. But I think only six were built. And the, the founders were Chuchi, the Buddhists from Taiwan. And the master instructed me, you design a building that you are willing to put in your children in that school. <laughs> the, the building code is eight, but it, they spend for intensity 10. Intensity 10. And we use green architecture. The buildings are 20, 25 degrees. Um, uh, cooler in summer and 10 degrees lower in, in, in autumn. Using cross ventilation, the wind tower that we learned from the media, especially the Persian wind top wind tower, to collect the wind from above and ventilate the rooms below. That was very popular in the video this before they discovered oil. After they discovered oil, many of them forgot their tradition of uh, designing with nature. So you can see in here, um, tall buildings, even Chilan Kagatin also. So most of this is in the tall buildings in, in uh, this is Asia. Next slide. 1,800. So in Europe, 140. Asia, 1,817. And they excluded the Middle East. Next slide. Middle East, uh, 254. But supposed to be Middle East and Asia are both in Asia. Uh, so more than 2,000 buildings in, in Asia. Next slide. Asia and Middle East, so we combine it now. Next slide. Asia versus North America. Um, and um, 667 in North America, 1,817 in Asia. These are the 150 meters and above. So you can see the shifting uh, of tall buildings, which started in Chicago and New York many, centuries, many decades ago, about 100 years ago. Uh, because the Empire State is, uh, is celebrating its 100 years, or we just celebrated. Next slide. Um, Asia versus Central America. So Asia, 1,800. Central America is only 57. Next slide. Uh, Asia versus South America. South America, 45. Asia, 1,800. Next slide. So Oceania, that's Australia and New Zealand. Only 83, Asia 1,800, excluding the Middle East. Next slide. Uh, uh, Africa, only 6, Asia 1,800. It's 2,000 with the Middle East. Next slide. So, tall buildings around the world. So, South America 45, Central America 57, North America 667, Europe 140, Africa 6, Middle East 254. If you include it with Asia, more than 2,000. Oceania, Ocean, Australia and New Zealand only 83. So you can see the shift towards uh, Asian cities. Next slide. So tall buildings in top 100. 
So you can see in here. Most of them in Asia with the Middle East. Next slide. Cities with tall building, top uh, 100. We are now referring to cities. The past century was uh, a century of nations, maybe because of the United Nations. This century will be a century of cities. Because uh, like when you go to Dubai, and you go to United Arab Emirates, say you go to Dubai. Uh, you go to New York, you don't say you go to the USA. You go to Manila, even if you go to Pampanga, so you go to Manila, not go to the Philippines. So this century will be a century of cities. Next slide. Uh, again, the tallest building in every region. Yeah. So that's uh, the Trump Ocean Club International Hotel Tower. That was the one that we had to change the rules and measuring the uh, which entrance of the building should be measured. Next slide. So tallest building in every region. So North America, you have the One World Trade Center. And in, in South America, Story Costanera. And then uh, Trump Ocean Club International Hotel and Tower. And then Mercury City in, where is this, Europe. Burj Khalifa in, in Middle East. Carlton Center in, I don't know which country, that's in uh, uh, Africa. And then Taipei 101 and, uh, and, and Tower 1. This will be overtaken by Shanghai Tower this year, the Taipei 101. Next slide. The top 10 tallest building in the world. You have the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, Mecca Royal Clock Tower in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, One World Trade Center in New York, USA, Taipei 101 in Taipei, Shanghai World Financial Center in Shanghai. But this will change this year. The, uh, International Cent Commerce Center in Hong Kong, Petronas Tower 1 and 2 in Kuala Lumpur, Chifeng Tower in Nanjing, Willis Tower, the former Sis Tower in Chicago. Next slide. And Burj Khalifa is still the tallest building in the world today. Um, Mecca Royal Tower in Saudi Arabia. The Taipei 101 in Taiwan. That's, this is of all last, as of last year. Shanghai World Financial Center in China. Next slide. Uh, then the International Commerce Center in Hong Kong, the World, World World Trade Center in New York, the Petronas Tower. Uh, can you go back? One thing the Petronas Tower uh, introduced is the pedestrian bridge between the, between the two towers. It's not just an architectural statement. It's also for emergency route. If one building is on fire, you can move to the other building. And it also reduces the use of the elevators. So you can move from one building to the other, you're going down the elevators. And this started the skywalks connecting buildings. Next slide. And Shifeng, Shifeng Tower in Nanjing. Next slide. China also. Willis Tower, the former Shis Tower in Chicago. Next slide. And the tallest building by 2020. I described it earlier in the start of the, of the meeting. So it's really shifting towards Asia and the Middle East. So the Kingdom Tower by 2020 Saudi Arabia will become the tallest building in the world with more than 1,000 meters. And today it's the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, 828 meters. And 19 meters will be in Asia and Middle East. 19 buildings will be in Asia and the Middle East, only one in North America. Next slide. So tallest buildings by 2020, Kingdom Tower, Jeddah, Burj Khalifa, Dubai, Pin An Finan Center in Shenzhen, China, Seoul Light, the DMC Tower in Seoul, Korea, Signature Tower in Jakarta. So Jakarta will be number five in the world with tallest building by 2020. And Shanghai Tower in China again, Wuhan, Greenland, Wuhan, Asia, Mecca Royal Clock Tower in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. This year is number two in the world after Burj Khalifa. But beta then they will slide down to number eight. Next slide. Golden Finance Change in Asia. Number nine. Lotte World in Seoul, Korea. Doha Convention Center, Doha. One World Trade Center, New York. Also, it's slid down from 2014. Chow Tai Fook, uh, Changjin, China. Uh, Changjin Chow Tai Fook, Binhai Center, also in, in China. Dalian Greenland Center in China. Uh, Pentominium, Dubai, Busan Lotte Town Center in Korea, number 17, 
And Taipei 101 has slid down. I, I think it was number four, number five. Number 18 by 2020. Rise of Hanglong Center in Asia, number 19. And the Shanghai World Financial Center, I think it was number six in 2014. It will be number 20. Next slide. Kingdom Tower. In fact, aside from the, uh, what I'll be telling you, that you can put nine blocks of the city in one tower and make it sustainable, uh, having a tall building gives a uh, brand to the city. Tall buildings are branding cities. So uh, Dubai was, not many of us knew Dubai in the 70s, although I was working in Dubai already at that time. And it's part of the branding, the tall buildings. So like New York, Chicago, it was, they were the brand years ago. Next slide. And one thing with tall buildings, it's an opportunity to research on improving building technology. And um, the last conference, it was us, among us participants, those who are involved in tall buildings, how comfortable the tallest building we can design. And we architects, structural engineers, um, elevatoring companies, we all got agreed that we can now design a three-kilometer building, three kilometers. But the ones objecting were mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, <laughs> plumbing and sanitary engineers, and fire protection engineers. They were objecting. But uh, our architects, structural engineers, and elevator companies, we like it. I asked the elevator companies, how come you like it? They say, it's like a railway just making it vertical. <laughs> so this is Pin An Finance Center in Shenzhen, China. Then Soul Light Tower. You can see the everybody, all of these stuff, pretty big, they, they are unique, memorable, and identifiable. Then try to visualize the tall buildings being built in our part of the world. And, and here they give uniqueness to the place. Yeah, next slide. So, Jakarta. You can see it here that there's a sense of place on the top part. I don't know what that symbolizes, uh, whether something natural in, in Jakarta, maybe a fruit, or I, I have to read the background, or some Islamic symbols. Yeah. Next slide. And Shanghai Tower, Shanghai. Next slide. And then Wuhan, Greenland in Wuhan. Next slide. Mm -hmm. in China, called in finance. Next slide. Uh, Lotte World Tower, South Korea. Next slide. The Doha Convention Center in Qatar. Then you have the Chanjin Chow in Nanjing, China. Next slide. Uh, the Yang Greenland, big developer in China. Mm -hmm. You can see the Sky Gardens here and uh, refugee floors or sky gardens in Petomunyun in Dubai. Then Busan Lodi Town Center in Busan, China. And Kaiser Fenglong Center, Shenzhen, China. Then two 2014 tall buildings with you. So 97 cities with confusion, there are 54. 200 meters and above. And 19 countries uh, completed with 60%, 76% in Asia. And super tall building, two more than the previous record, reaching 2010, 2011, 2012. And 52 buildings composed of structural materials, steel and, uh, and concrete. South America completed its first super tall buildings, a 300 meter uh, Torre Tora Costanera. So 23,333 um, buildings, meters, total height of 97 completions in 2014. The tallest year ever. So 2014 had the in history of tall building construction. It was the highest in 2014. Next slide. The original completed tall building. So 1930s to 2014. So you can see Asia and Middle East are the red and green to combine them. Still the highest. And in 1930, all the tall buildings were in North America. 
1950, South America was included. And uh, 2014, it's really Asia in the Middle East. And uh, the blue color, North America, becoming less and less. So you can see the, the shifting of the world's tallest building. And try to relate this to GDP growth rate. I think it's similar. You see the graph of GDP growth here? It really moved to Asia away from North America and Western Europe. Next slide. So now we, we go to our country. Uh, we're still collecting uh, some, uh, some data. And 34 buildings, over 150 meters, residential. 20 office buildings, hotel office two. Hotel residential two, office residential one. The number of tall buildings that remains by building height, 300 meters and above, zero. So we don't have yet uh, super tall, a uh, mega tall and super tall. 200 meters and above, 19. 100 meters and above, 40. Next slide. Uh, one difficulty of our country, people are reluctant to share the information. What will be the tallest buildings by 2020? Maybe there are some being drawn now, but uh, owners are, and architects have confidentiality process not to release it. Yeah. I think we just go to the next one now. Because we have to confirm whether these are, yeah, next slide. Yeah. Advantages of tall buildings, growing taller and denser versus horizontal sprawl or spread offers distinct advantages for urban infrastructure systems. I told you about it. Like you, you can combine nine blocks of the city in one tower. So in terms of utilities, road length, garbage collection, it's more, it's cheaper, it's faster, it's more sustainable. Next slide. Uh, this is the building in Bahrain. Officially designed to be these utilize less materials for enclosure per unit of usable forest space. And the natural, and you can see this, uh, this windmills for energy as well. Initially, they have problems of vibration, but they, uh, they were able to address it. And harvesting solar and wind energy, the height. Next slide. Um, Sanjian, China. Uh, the advantages of tall buildings. Buildings of three to four stories are inherently the most cost efficient when factoring land use and cost, cost of construction, efficiency of floor plates, and efficiency of structure. And, but when you start combine, combining it with the land values, the suppressor to go high. Uh, in fact, the villages of Makati and the villages around Green Hills, it's the reverse of urban land economics. Your land value ideally should be just 10 to 20%. The building value is 50 percent. If you look at the areas of Makati, is the reverse. The land value may be 90 percent. The building value is just 10 percent. So even urban land economics doesn't make sense. Even in transportation, it doesn't make sense. Where you are in a central business district, you should have more families, higher density, to have more people within walking distance, most to the place of work. The more progressive cities in the world. The employees spend 300 hours a year in traffic. Our central business districts in Makati, Ortigas, and maybe even Cubao in Manila, we spend 1,000 hours a year in traffic. So we're wasting 700 hours a year in traffic. And um, if you have an economic life of 40 years, times 700 years of wasted through traffic, and Jaika, I think Jaika estimated lost time due to traffic, flooding, obsolete infrastructure. In Metro Manila, is uh, uh, $20 million a year due to obsolete infrastructure time. $20 million a year. Yeah. Next slide. So, advantages of tall buildings. Taller structures need mechanized vertical circulation, concrete resistance structure, mechanical and electrical, and planning shops and multiple exit ways which all effect net to grow efficiencies and add to the net cost per unit. So I told you a while ago, the west block of Rockwell, the result tower, Luna, Morsoli is the Morsoli West, and Hidalgo, the, the ones that we were the architects, 200 families per hectare. And as I said, you compare it to Fort Spark, only four families per hectare. So 
you have the answer. This one is more sustainable. With very very um, uh, scarce urban land resources, I did, we just put the picture in the uh, lower right. Yeah, stone hands in England, and I was assuming maybe that was the inspiration for the Manila basins in Singapore. I'm not sure, but you can see the similarity. So thousands of years ago, somebody made this natural uh, architectural form. Already. Next slide. And uh, accessibility to goods and services, cultural events, communal spaces for human interaction, and live work environment accessible by walking is often the result of an appropriately scaled high density area. So these are housing developments in Singapore. I think inspiration is the Twin Towers of Malaysia. So it's a vertical neighborhood. So if you, you have a unit on the other end, and the unit of your mother-in-law is on the other end. You don't have to go down the elevator. You just walk through the sky bridges. And also emergencies. If one tower is on fire, you can move to the other tower. Next slide. So again, the comparison with stone hands. This is in Abu Dhabi, other gate towers. Views from within the tall buildings are also coveted and the higher the occupancy space, the better the vista and the more valuable the space. So as you go higher, there's a value to the wider panoramic view. Yeah. Next slide. And the shark in London. I, I think this is the building that I talk about, that they were allowed to go taller because a square is building with, with block, some important landmark. So as when a super tall tower is built, it will most generally increase the value of everything around it, putting pressure at adjacent sites to maximize their potential and develop tall structures. Yeah. I think it, even John, John Stump confirmed that uh, one option we had for Rockwell was I love that here, two stories. The land value would just have doubled. But having this high risk mixed development, it's 15 times value appreciation in land value. And I think John Stump confirmed that it's the highest value appreciation in real estate in the whole country the past 15 years. So Rockwell had the option to make it a la belle air. But thanks to the late handed office, you have given the inspiration we had for Rockwell when we were designing it was Copley Place, Boston, uh, Embarcadero, San Francisco, Pacific Place, Hong Kong, and Canary Park, London. Those were our initial inspirations. So advantage of tall buildings. Tall building demands substantially higher rents or prices than those with normal buildings to building use. And a clear day, it is possible to see the curvature of the earth. Next slide. So that's Boston Emerald again as a sample. Tall towers can be a financial um, bust to a developer who sets out to build just the tall tower, but they can bring great economic vitality to the surrounding city. Next slide. So advantages of tall buildings. Super tall and mega tall building can be a landmark status. So they, they they make the city visually powerful and branding of the city as a city brand. Next slide. So earthquake adaptation, this is the Taipei 101. This is the big ball of steel here where, where it adapts. When the building sways, the pendulum balances the swaying in the building. This is one of the most sustainable tall buildings in the world. They did it by retrofitting. Next slide. Yeah, people ask about earthquakes. Uh, if I remember the numbers right, if there's a 7.2 earthquake magnitude, this is a JICA study, only 2% of tall buildings were collapsed. Only 2%. 30% of low rise buildings were collapsed in Metro Manila. Because the tall buildings, they use professionals, they do a lot of wind tunnel testing, earthquake analysis, and so on. But many of the lower buildings, they will choose professionals. And I heard some of them are well built, were built on top of the fault line. You should never build on top of a fault, earthquake fault line. Volcanologists tell us you can build five meters away from it, but never on top of it. The fault line, the valley fault line is about 70 kilometers from Bulacan to, through Metro Manila to Cavite and Laguna. 
and elsewhere in the world, like uh, Andreas Fault Line in California, everybody knows where it is. It's a bicycle path, it's a jogging path, it's a tourist attraction. But here, some structures are on top of them. And in case of a 7.2 magnitude uh, Jaika study, uh, Metro Manila were divided into four quadrants. North and south of Pasig River, seven bridges were collapsed, east and west of the fault line. So I, I'm wondering whether our leaders have done a contingency plan, like if bridges collapse. Okay. And I've been recommending that all these uh, studies, we should now be doing at least a structural audits so we can retrofit. Even most of us architects and engineers in this country, we are all competing for the 6% new buildings. Not many are looking at the 94% old buildings. And I went to Japan, talked to the top structural engineers, how they retrofit buildings after an earthquake. And they're, they're partnering with us here and several from Europe and the US to, to do a structural architectural assessment of buildings, audit, and they can be retrofitted and lend them the life. Right. Next slide. So 7.2 earthquake magnitude. This is 2004 study. 33,500 will be killed immediately. 130,000 130, injured. And depending on the wind speed after the earthquake, 7,900 and 18,300 at 8 meters per second. So this is 2004. We have more population now 10 years from 2004 today. Next slide, human casualties. So retaking the skyscraper in the ecological aid, design principles for a new high-rise vernacular. Anthony Wood is our executive director of the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, headquartered in Chicago. And we just released it quickly. Um, uh, so you have here Warsaw, Miami, and Melbourne. And um, examples. So design principle, as I, I have verbalized a while ago, tall buildings should relate to the physical characteristics of the place. So the Leaden Hall building in London, the slope is response not to block the views from St. Paul's Cathedral, no, it's not a big band, St. Andrew under Shaft Church. And one thing you can see, the lower floors, it's public space. The public realm from the sidewalk from the street can go through the building, even if you have to pay. So these are public spaces, and also the observation deck. Next slide. Uh, tall buildings should relate to the environmental characteristics of the place, uh, like the Pearl River Tower in Guangzhou. Climatic elements are not only something to mitigate in tall building design, but can become embraced for positive effect in both the form and the operation of the tall building. The Pearl River Tower demonstrates these ideas. So you can see um, air passing through the building, especially in between floors. Even the way the, the, the windows, there are small gaps that air can flow through. Next slide. Um, tall buildings should relate to the cultural characteristics of the place. The Yubumi complex in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So you can see the Malaysian and Islamic patterns in the architecture. So, the Yubabi complex with its facade, a modern interpretation of the Islamic uh, Hali or Jani screen. So it's part of the facade. So, it's the architecture of a particular place, not just the architecture of anywhere, elsewhere, everywhere. Next slide. Uh, variation with building height, inform texture, and program, which can approximately 6 to 8 degrees Celsius cooler at the top than at the bottom. Next slide. Uh, maximizing layers of uh, development program and usage on all systems of materials. The NBK was actually building in Tokyo. The bio skin, solar shading shields, and internal spaces from solar gain, and through the system containing recycled, harvested rainwater, and simultaneously reduces the external urban heat island effect through evaporation. Compare the facade of just Glass facade. How much heat they throw into the public space. Here you have absorbed it and make it into energy. Next slide. And design principle number six 
tall buildings should provide significant communal open recreational spaces. And um, one of the best examples of sky garden tall buildings in the world. I think this is in Frankfurt, Germany. And this is many years ago. One way of reducing the heat entering, they put uh, trees inside the building as well. Next slide. Uh, design principle number seven. Introduce more facade envelope opaqueness, opacity. Concentrate glazing where it is best placed. All glass facades are not advised in intense solar environments. Compare this building, uh, this is in Dubai, and it doesn't absorb the heat inland or the heat inside or emit the heat outside. These glass buildings, they bounce back the heat in the public area. Next slide. And design principle number eight, embrace organic vegetation, essential part of material. Shows what is not becoming possible with greenery in the skin of high rise buildings and even top of buildings. We now have vertical gardens as building envelopes. This is in Sydney. Next slide. Uh, design principle number nine, introduce physical, circulatory, and programmatic connections between tall buildings, sky bridges. Uh, I told you about this is in uh, Twin Towers in. Uh, Petronas, Malaysia. Next slide. And we need to bring all aspects of the city up into the sky. Marina Basin, Sky Park, Singapore. So you see this in the ground floor spaces of the cities, but here they put it in the So all aspects of the building were brought up to the sky. And the world's highest tennis court in Dubai. Uh, this is in Woods, uh, 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 Al Arab. And I remember, I think maybe 10 years ago, there was a big conference among finance ministers and central bank ministers in Dubai. And one of the speakers was Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton used to be paid $70,000 for a speech. In Dubai, they gave him $1 million. And of course, I was so, wow. Then, the same month, Tiger Woods, he, he did a tea off here. He was paid $3 million of the agency. The golfer was paid more than the president, past president. And this, this same green area here. Next slide. So Kingdom Tower, that's a short uh, case study or sample for this afternoon. Official name Kingdom Tower, structural type of it's a building, under construction. I think we'll be finished by 2019 or something. Kingdom City, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Service apartments, the function, residential hotel and office. Structural material, concrete. Imagine the tallest building in the world will be concrete. And proposed construction 2011. Construction started 2014. Yeah, completion 2018. Next slide. And the height to the tip at the moment is 1,000 meters plus. Structural height, 1,000 meters up. Observatory, 634 meters. Floors above ground, 167 floors. Floors below ground, two floors. Number of elevators, 57. Top elevator speed, 10 meters per second. Tower glass floor, gross floor area of the tower, 258,000 square meters. So that's almost 26 hectares for area. Uh, development gross floor area, uh, almost 81 hectares, 8,127,000 square meters. Number of apartments, 550. This is one village in our country, or in one building. Number of hotel rooms, 200. Number of parking spaces, 3,190. And next, uh, a study, uh, Estilla Kingdom Tower, is the Jet Economic Company, Kingdom Holding Company. The architects, Edgar Smith Gordon Hill. He used to be with SOM. He was the designer for SOM for Woods Khalifa. He put up his new, new company. Project manager, DC Harris and Mays. I think these are European firms. Main contractor is Bin Laden, Saudi Bin Laden. Uh, it's the family of Basama. Uh, but there are 56 brothers. 11 of them went to Harvard. <laughs> brothers and sisters. Yeah. Consultant, civil geotechnical, land engineering, environmental services. Landscape is WA. Wind. Analysis consultant, RWDI. Material supplier, crane, uh, uh, linear, elevator, cone, elevator. 
It's a free advertisement for them, but we just want to acknowledge them. I might be accused of plagiarism. <laughs> so, um, no, we're, we are sharing with you so you see the complexity and interdisciplinarity and uh, multidisciplinarity of doing a uh, co building. Next night, and the Kingdom Tower again, that just like Burj Khalifa, it tapers the wings as you go up, produce an aerodynamic shape that helps reduce structural loading due to wind vortex setting. My first helicopter survey of Tacloban was telling our architects and engineers in the office, we should now study aerodynamics. I saw in Tacloban the round building survive. And, and I made a controversial comment that we build monuments for the dead, we don't even build decent housing for the living. Because the cemetery, they survive, the mausoleum. But the houses of the poor, they were so flimsy. And my immediate reaction was, was quoted in both local and international media was, in our part of the world, we seem to build monuments for the dead. We don't even provide decent housing for the living. Um, Sky Terrace, roughly 30 meters in diameter, level of 157. High performance exterior wall system, a series of not just great pockets of shadows in some areas, three petal footprint. So as you look down, these petals are found in the deserts of Saudi Arabia. So there's relationship whether uh, to the culture of the place, the religion of the place, or something natural. So it's slender, slightly asymmetrical mass. Next slide. The sky terrace, the waterfront development, the facade and one of the entrances. Next slide. And Burj Khalifa uh, in Dubai. Originally called uh, Burj Dubai. Burj in Arabic is tower. Burj. Uh, structural type uh, building. Status completed. Location, number one, Yimar Boulevard in Dubai. I, I think this used to be a military camp or police police uh, camp, uh, compound. Office residential hotel, the function, structural material, still in concrete composite. 2003 proposed construction, 2004, 2010. We had the developers and the architects made the presentation and they told us the story that originally it was going to be 500 meters. And slowly, secretly, when going up and up. Next slide. And uh, height to tip is 828.8 meters. Architectural height is 828 meters. So this is the official TTVUH height, 828 meters, as we certified from the Council for Communities and Urban Habitat. Observatory is 500, 555 meters, 0.7. Imagine if you go there more than half a kilometer up. Floors above ground, 163 floors. Floors below ground, only one. Uh, you might wonder why. In that part of the world, they have a very high water table. So when you do a building in Dubai, you look for a dewatering lagoon. You will dewater and ask permission from the municipality where you can you can pipe your dewater in your place. Number of elevators, 58. Speed of elevator, 10 meters per second. Tower gross floor area is 30 hectares, or 309,000 square meters. Number of apartments, 900. Number of hotel rooms, 304. And number of parking spaces, 2,957. Uh, the light rail transit connects there. Uh, Burj Khalifa, um, Elmer Properties, architect, engineer, Skidmore Owings Marriott. Uh, their designer was Adrian Smith and Gordon Hill, who put up their company to do the uh, the one in Kingdom Tower, Saudi Arabia. Project manager, Terrain Construction, USA. Main contractor, Samsung. The one that I told you that we became elevated fellow in, in the Council for Tall Buildings in 2013, uh, the, uh, the one from Samsung and, and I were the only two elevated to fellow in 2013 from all over the world. And for such a humbling honor. Consultant, Geotechnical, ACOM. ACOM is the largest uh, architecture engineering firm in the world. And they have 3,000 employees. The facade, Far East Coast Global, Alpha cladding, or AAP, wind, and material supplier, cladding, elevator, and sealant. So you can see the 
complexity and multidisciplinary team as I put it. Next slide. And Burj Khalifa, 26 uh, helical levels decreased. The cross section of the tower incrementally as it spirals skyward. It's triple lobe footprint. There's like three legs footprint. And obstruction of the high melocalis flower in the deserts of Dubai. Modular Y shaped structure with setbacks along each of its three wings. It's ideal for residential and green park. Next slide. So, features the sky lobbies, the corporate suites, the uh, clouds, state of the art fitness facilities, recreational areas, swimming pools from the inside, the outside balcony, public observatory, ultra luxury hotel residences, innovative technology, digital communication services. We just finished this sports Khalifa, but then I'll need water to be also. Next slide. <laughs> yeah. So, official name uh, this is Shanghai. It will be open this year with the tallest in Asia, outside the Middle East. Shanghai Tower building, top off, energy level, location in Shanghai. Hotel office functions, it has retail also, structural, composite, concrete still. 2008 started construction, 2015 completion. Next slide. So, height to tip, 632 meters, architecture about 662, 32, observatory, 561 meters. Floors above ground, 128. Floors below ground, five, uh, five floors. Number of elevators, 106. Top elevator speed, 18 meters per second. Tower gross floor area, 42 hectares, so 420,000 square meters. Uh, development construction gross floor area, 52 hectares, or 521,000 square meters. Hotel rooms, 258. Parking spaces, 1,100. Less than two ways of the river because of their public transit. Next slide. And Shanghai Tower, Shanghai Tower Construction Development Owner. Uh, his architect is an engineer, Art Gensler. He was my professor in Harvard Graduate School of Design. Architect of record, Tonji University, Structural Agricultural, MEP, Tonton Tomasetti, Project Manager, Main Contractor, and so on. Next. And Shanghai Tower. So you can see all the consultants, cause, fire. Sometimes I think uh, Burj Khalifa was 75 consultancy firms. We're, we're, we're involved there. So you can see all these various uh, interdisciplinary teams. Next night, and Shanghai Tower, it's like a twisting, tapering, spiral form, rounded corners, fat, tune mass damper, innovative skin circular inner glass facade. You can see these nine blocks put on top of the other. From hotel, culture of the observatory, to offices, to residential, to shopping and retail. So the, the building twist or rotate about 120 degrees, optimal rotation. This is not just architectural. They studied it with the wind, wind tunnel analysis. Next slide. And this is the lower ground. So what can you see here? Unlike in our part of the world, people, some developers, some not all, they know how they want to reach the sky, but they don't know how to make the ground. And here they will study it. Like if you have 5,000 people above the ground, there's an emergency. Can those 5,000 people fit into the plaza of the high-rise building? That will include ambulances, fire trucks, police cars, and try to observe around Makati, around Metro Manila, whether that's being funded. So sky lobbies, offices, commercials, public. Make up daylighting, landscaping, wind, and June mass numbers features. Next slide. And metropolis. I think we'll go back to this. So from the tall buildings, we'll go down again to urban habitat. So architectural tall buildings and urban planning of the metropolis. Thank you. And let's take a break. Yeah. Thank you.